Please, uh, may I uh, have your attention for uh, Kai de Vos, uh, who is going to talk about the RED programming language from uh, systems programming to declarative GUI uh, Hello. I've seen you all uh, during the rest of the day, so I will try to hurry up a bit. I've got uh, a lot I want to show. It's, uh, it's almost all of it is uh, practical. Uh, uh, I'm going to show the red programming language and uh, I usually uh, don't make slides but I, uh, I show what uh, the state of the development of the language is because it's a new language and I'm, uh, I'm constantly uh, making uh, bindings to libraries and, uh, and examples uh, to test that and, and show how it's used. And. Uh, I don't know how many of you have seen the, uh, the announcement on the website, which I have opened here. Has anyone read the website before coming here? Two, three people? <laughs> okay, well, um, I'm, I'm trying to, to get the fonts uh, as high as possible uh, so that uh, the, the programming examples will be uh, visible and they will also come out right on recording. And so the, the, the picture in effect is, uh, is a bit weird because it's showing the, the top left corner uh, of my laptop display. So I'm going to have to maneuver a bit uh, to, to show... Uh, Quite if you maximize uh, Firefox then... Then it's going to be uh, out of the picture. Sure. Okay. Because uh, I'm, I'm only bothered by the, the left uh, bar at this moment. Uh, but it's not really important because uh, if, if you go to the website and you go to the, the page for my presentation, uh, uh, we can have a, a, a small overview of what RED is as a programming language and uh, uh, the announcement that I was going to talk about uh, bindings to the 0MQ and, uh, and SQLite uh, libraries, uh, uh, which uh, have also been present here. 0MQ in the form of the nano message presentation. Uh, so it's very nice that you've got an introduction of that, uh, especially that they were uh, slides, so I will show some programming examples. Okay, about uh, RED as a new programming language. Um, it's, uh, it's, uh, well, it's, it's, it's strongly inspired, almost compatible with uh, the Rebel programming language. And on the one hand, that's, uh, a, you could say, a very modern, innovative programming language. But on the other hand, uh, Rebel is almost 20 years old now. Anyone heard of it? No. <laughs> yeah. Heard of it, never used it. Two people? OK. Yeah. So I can start with Three. a clean slate here. Three people. Yeah. Uh, Vadim has done uh, presentations with me. Um, uh, anyone heard of Lisp or Scheme? Okay, a few more people. Uh, REPL has been described as a scheme for the masses. It, it, uh, it takes a lot from scheme. It was, REPL was developed by an old uh, Lisper, as he describes himself. And, uh, but uh, Lisp and scheme haven't really broken through. It's a fairly obscure topic in computer science. Uh, one of the reasons is that it's fairly mathematical and uh, only half readable. Some people say that uh, Lisp, Lisp is for Lisp, pr Lisp processing, but some people say it stands for lots of irritating single parentheses. And uh, uh, one of the things about REPL is that it, uh, it tries to look like, uh, like English. So it looks a lot cleaner and, uh, and, uh, and it really tries hard to be uh, more readable. <coughs> and uh, not, not, not really in a COBOL way, not really in a business way, but still in a, in a mathematical-like computer science way because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a fairly scheme-like engine, but it also takes inspiration from uh, Forth and uh, uh, well, what was the children's language? Logo, oh. inspired by scheme, but uh, meant to teach uh, children uh, programming. 
and the uh, rebel takes inspiration from that. Uh, so Lisbon scheme haven't really broken through because they're too academic probably. Uh, rebel hasn't really broken through in almost 20 years in large part because that's exactly when the uh, open source and free software revolution happened. So it started as a very standard American commercial product by a, a small company with investors. Um, but during that 20 years of development, the world turned on its head and now nobody wants to use a programming language that's not open source because then you're, you're stuck in someone else's tools. And uh, uh, Rebel 3 is actually open source now, but only since a year. Uh, and <coughs> two and a half years ago, uh, someone from the Rebel community started the Red programming language to solve all Rebel's problems. Uh, the biggest problem being that it wasn't open source, but also a whole series of technical things. Uh, Rebel is sort of in the class of Python or Ruby, more or less. It's an interpreted uh, language, which means it's mostly for scripting. But it's from Carl Sassenrad, who did, uh, designed the, the Amiga operating system a quarter century ago. You still know it. Yeah. Amiga OS. Yeah. Anyone else knows Amiga OS? It's, it's legendary for older people. <coughs> no offense. <laughs> But it's uh, uh, many, many uh, uh, modern and advanced operating systems take inspiration from Amiga OS. And Carl Sassenrad continued with his uh, programming language uh, project afterwards. And that's Rebel. So Red can be thought of as the, uh, the open source successor, but also as a technical successor. Uh, Rebel was, uh, is purely an interpreter. Uh, Red has an interpreter, but it also has a compiler, so it can be much faster, and uh, there can be much more type checking at compile time, which is important for uh, for robustness of uh, of software. software. And there's a big uh, academic struggle between uh, uh, static and dynamic languages, and type checking or no type checking, and how. And uh, uh, Red has. Uh, uh, a very uh, nice uh, sweet spot in between. Uh, you can develop in, uh, in the interpreter, just like in Rebel, very, very quickly scripting. And uh, if you want to do more type checking, or you want to uh, have higher performance, or you want to hide the source code in a commercial project, you just put it through the compiler afterwards. But actually, the compiler is so fast, uh, because Red programs are typically very small, uh, that in, in many projects I, I always compile because you, then you always get the, the extra type checking and you get extra, extra warnings uh, during programming. So uh, if you know a bit about Lisp and Scheme, you know sort of what to expect and that's the sort of thing that's listed here. Uh, oh yeah, I've got a mouse pointer outside the screen. Um, it's a functional language uh, but actually, that's only the, the default engine. Uh, Rebel and Red are so flexible, they're language construction kits. So the uh, uh, Red doesn't really have uh, uh, a, a, a syntax, a, a grammar. It, it has a spelling, it has a lexical notation for values, but it hardly has any, uh, any grammar uh, to, to the, the order in which the words uh, must fit. The, the only sort of grammar is that you have uh, uh, blocks uh, denoted by square brackets and, uh, and uh, parentheses like in many other programming languages and of course Lisp and Scheme are completely built up out of lists uh, uh, delimited by parentheses. And uh, in addition to that, uh, Red has the, the block type, and actually the block type is, uh, is, uh, is elementary in Red instead of the, uh, the parenthesis, the limited list in, uh, in Lisp. But we'll see that in, in a while in the code examples. So there are all sorts of uh, other buzzwords, uh, mostly known to, uh, to hardcore language developers. Uh, Homo iconic is an extension of what I just said. 
Uh, it, it doesn't really have its own syntax, so the functional style is only the default uh, code evaluator and the default compiler. Uh, uh, and because it's so flexible, uh, it can be defined in itself. And that's a sort of academic hobby in, in Lisp and scheme-like languages and, uh, and, uh, and ML, meta language and languages like those. Uh, it's, a, it's a desired academic property if, uh, if a language is its own uh, meta language and uh, Red can do that by being homo-iconic. So you can describe its, its lexical notation and its very little syntax in its, in its own terms. Um, and uh, eventually that could mean that you could write the language in, in, in uh, implementation in itself. You could write the interpreter or compiler in the language itself. Now, Rebel never did that. Rebel is written in C uh, to, to, to not uh, put down the performance too much because Rebel is not uh, the slowest language, but it is quite slow, being an interpreter and a, and a high-level language with dynamic types. And the Red fixes that in several ways by having a, a, a compiler, uh, but also uh, Red, uh, uh, if you would implement Red in Red, it would be very slow because red as a high level language is not the fastest language you can think of uh, so therefore rebel is implemented in c but that uh, means that you never get rid of c and by by designing a new language you would like to replace all the previous languages because you must be convinced that your new language is better but then you have the the performance problem so Rebel is written in C, and Red solves this in an innovative way uh, by not being one language, but two. There's Red, and there's Red System. And Red System was developed first, and it's very much uh, a, a language in the class of C. It's a sort of C uh, compiled language with a, a, a Rebel Red syntax. And then you're going back to the homo iconicity and the, the fact that it's a language toolkit, uh, the fact that there is no grammar, only a, a lexical notation, uh, means that you might as well define a C-style language in it, in that notation. So what Red did, uh, it first defined uh, a, a C-class language, but in a, no, in a Rebel notation. And the Red system compiler is written in Rebel. And that's a bootstrap phase, eventually, uh, the Red System compiler will be rewritten in Red, but currently it's written in Rebel. So there's a, a, a nice academic loop for you, but it's also very practical. Um, this is possible because it's uh, homo-iconic and, uh, and it has no real syntax. So there's a syntax for a C-class language, as sufficient as C almost, and there's a, a language uh, notation which was already there, which was Rebel because Red is a higher level language built on top of Red System. Uh, so instead of being written in C, Red is written in Red System. And we'll see what that means in practice in a while. <coughs> and currently there are compilers for Red System and for Red, and there is an interpreter for Red. So it's very much like Rebel now, and for the future, uh, a JET compiler is planned to make it even more complete and even more flexible. So it's really a, a, a full stack um, of, of, of two programming languages and two compilers and an interpreter and a planned JIT compiler. So you get a complete stack from the bottom, from the hardware to the highest level of dynamic scripting and network programming. And that's the goal of Red, to, to be a complete stack and to depend on as, as few other subsystems as possible. So, for example, most languages use the, the, these days use the GCC compiler for C and C++, or many languages which are implemented in, in C, such as Rebel, need to be compiled with GCC. But not Red, because Red has its own Red system compiler replacing C. So we're completely independent from any C compiler or C++ compiler. Do any of you have a, an idea how big GCC is these days? Yeah, big. 
Now, I don't know the number of lines, but uh, uh, five years ago, uh, if you downloaded GCC and you wanted only C and C++, uh, it, but the download was about 20 MB or something, and that unpacks the 40, 50 MB. And in a few years, I've seen that double several times. So it's about four times as big now. So the, the download is now somewhere between 30 to 50, 60 megabytes if you want extra languages. And, uh, and uh, we're also doing an operating system project. And at some point, I couldn't compile the new GCC with itself because it, it had become twice as big and it uncovered memory management bugs in the kernel of our operating system. So you will, it was really debilitating. And of course, we fixed those memory bugs. But GCC uh, doubled in size was the only one that found it. And before that, you could compile everything and you could compile the operating system and the kernel and GCC itself. And, and those, those, uh, those bugs didn't show. So GCC is really stressing systems and it's growing ever, ever, ever bigger. LLPMs I think it's because of all the optimizers in it. Yeah. That, that too, um, but, but at some point you wonder, well, what on earth do, do they put in there? Because it becomes 10% faster and that's it. And, and then you start, really start thinking, what's, what's, what's the point? What's the, what's the added value? It's become so much heavier for so little added value. In economic terms, it's the, uh, yeah, the, 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 mirwa, the, the, the added value gets ever, ever less. It's like the low-hanging fruit in a, in, in a previous presentation. We've had the low-hanging low fruit in compilers, and now you, you, you have to do a lot of extra work for very little gain. So, um, uh, knowing that GCC is tens of megabytes, and we have uh, two languages. We have a red system compiler, uh, which is equivalent to C, and we have a, a red compiler, plus a red interpreter, which is equivalent to rebel. Uh, think about how, how big you think that is, and I'll take a question in the meantime. Uh, how much faster is the compiled red faster than the JIT compiled code? There, there's no JIT compiler yet. But, oh, uh, but right. I've done very simple benchmarks on the compiler and the interpreter, and right now the interpreter is uh, about twice as slow as rebel, because it compiles to Red System and Rebel is implemented in, uh, in C. And C is about four times as fast as Red System currently. So we've managed to get Red System uh, 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 four times as slow as C, which is, is already quite good because it doesn't have any optimizers at all. So we're going to optimize Red System towards the, the speed of optimized C. Uh, and then uh, the red interpreter will become at least as fast as the rebel interpreter written in C. And currently the, the red compiler is about twice as fast as the interpreter. So by compiling the, the, the high level code, you, you double its speed at least. And that will also improve over time because there's no optimization at all yet. So do you compile straight to machine code, just x86? The, the, the red system uh, compiler compiles straight to machine code. And that means that we need to duplicate the backends for different CPUs like GCC has. So it's a lot of work. It's a very ambitious project. And there are now uh, CPU backends for 32-bits uh, Intel and, uh, and ARM. And there's an experimental backend for 8-bit uh, AVR Atmel embedded CPUs, but that's un unfinished. In the well, what's in the in the low cost Arduinos, the the new Arduinos already have 32 bit ARM CPUs, but the older uh, cheap Arduinos have uh, 8 bit uh, uh, Atmel CPUs, and there's an experimental uh, backend for it, but it's not published. Have you looked at compiling to LLVM IR? Yeah, that's uh, what uh, uh, more or less. Uh, the, the second man in the project usually, uh, but it's founded by uh, Nenat uh, Rakosevich in, uh, uh, from Paris, but he's now in uh, Montenegro. And uh, um, <coughs> uh, he started out by evaluating LLVM to see if he could use that backend because that's, uh, uh, that, that's the usual thing to do. 
but LLVM is already a very big itself. It's, it's, it's vying to, to replace GCC, and uh, it, it, it was too much. So now back to my question, how, how large do you think uh, the red stack is? Uh, maybe unpacked with all the documentation, the, the, the packaged source code of two compilers and an interpreter and documentation and the test suite uh, is around a megabyte at this point, I believe, maybe two. Uh, but uh, uh, when you um, uh, compile a program, uh, a red program, you get not only your program compiled in there in the machine code, but also the red runtime because it's a high level language but with dynamic data types. So you need a type system in there and, and runtime functions. And uh, you get the, the entire interpreter in there. And at the moment, when you compile a red program for Intel, its uh, program becomes about 200 kilobytes. And that, that includes the interpreter. So how is, uh, is there, uh, I mean, do you, do you have libraries? I mean, as to the uh, standard I.O. stuff, etc. Uh, that's mostly my work, yeah. because I do all the bindings. Because mm -hmm. I'm not as usually concentrating on the, on the core language. And uh, I uh, want to make it uh, 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 usable in practice as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because uh, I want to switch from, uh, from Rebel to Red as quickly as possible. And, uh, if you, if you talk to Rebel people, they'll tell you that a lot is missing. Uh, but if you don't know Rebel and you compare it with uh, other languages such as C++ and Java that you might want to replace, uh, then there's actually uh, a, a, a lot less missing in Red. And uh, it's, uh, a, we're currently doing a commercial uh, product with a company in, uh, in California. And uh, I've decided to, to do that commercial product uh, in Red. And uh, I could have fallen back to Red System because Red System is mature now, two and a half years. And Red is only a year old. So uh, uh, I might have had to fall back to Red System and, and, and have a bit longer code, but it wasn't even necessary. But you do have to know what you're doing because, for example, there's no garbage collector yet. So I have to watch out for memory use in those uh, red programs. Uh, and if I want to, to get rid of that problem, I'd have to port it to red system. Uh, because there, like in C, you do your own memory management. Mm -hmm. And it's completely under your control. But the uh, porting is, uh, is much easier because, uh, because of the homo iconicity, red and red system are so much alike uh, that it's, uh, it's quite easy to start out with red in the interpreter and when you need more performance you, uh, you compile it and then when you uh, get, uh, get stuck on the lack of garbage collection and stuff like that you can port it further to red system. Another question? Okay, actually get rid of red system by writing a JIT compiler in red? No, we don't want to get rid of uh, red system. Because the, the JIT compiler will be a compiler for RED and it will also compile to RED system like uh, the current RED compiler but it will do it real time while you're working. So it will be basically be uh, the, the current compiler but compiling to memory and directly executing from memory. That's what a JIT compiler does. Yeah, I was wondering because it was a metal language if it could eat itself like PyPy. Um, yeah, but... Um, uh, what's being eaten is Rebel, because the compilers are currently written in Rebel. So Red System is here to stay because it replaces C for us in our stack. Uh, but what's being eaten are the Rebel compilers. Once uh, Red is mature enough, uh, the Red System and Red compilers will be rewritten from Rebel to Red, which is also already yeah. quite similar, so it's going to be a relatively easy port. I have to hurry a bit. Um, well, low memory footprint just said that uh, since the last release, we can not only compile executables but also shared libraries. So it becomes very easy to uh, write something in, in the Red or Red system and use it from another programming language as a shared library. So this is basically the, the theoretical description of the system. 
And what I wanted to point out is that uh, Bas has added some uh, links uh, to this uh, page uh, so that you can quickly go to the examples that I'm going to show. And uh, these are in, uh, in, uh, in fossil repositories. So you don't have to be uh, too scared because you've already seen this. Uh, he, uh, the link goes to the file section of each uh, fossil repository. And here we have... Uh, uh, oh yeah, I made uh, benchmarks here with uh, about seven, eight other languages. So there are uh, uh, several examples in here, in Red and Red System and uh, Ruby and, uh, and Rebel and, uh, and, uh, and C to, uh, to compare uh, simple examples. Well, I'll, uh, I'll show those in, uh, in Genie. So here are the, the links to the resources for this presentation. Uh, here are the SQLite and ZeroMQ examples that I will show. And here are the, the, the GUI examples, which are currently uh, implemented on top of uh, GTK+. And uh, uh, if you want uh, to try out anything, then here's a fossil repository with uh, binaries instead of source code. And uh, I do my, my build work here in a fossil repository. So this is also versioned, and this is the file section again. And here you can uh, see uh, uh, folders for all the targets that we support. So you can see that we have uh, two CPU backends, Android, which is ARM, and Android for uh, Intel, which you can use on the uh, Android uh, emulator while developing. Uh, here are the same. Uh, the normal Intel uh, Linux binaries and uh, the same for uh, ARM, which can run on uh, nice new things. Oh, which I forgot to unpack. There's no time to show it, but uh, we're running on these things with uh, the Linux ARM backend. Here's a Raspberry Pi. Nice new uh, uh, credit card sized computers, a very nice hardware development uh, the past few years. There are lots of other devices with uh, ARM chips on it. Uh, they're quite similar to what's in mobile phones these days. The, those are basically almost always ARM based. And uh, uh, we're, we're running on this, uh, uh, especially because the Raspberry Pi is running Linux. So uh, we're running uh, with uh, the, the Linux uh, ARM backend, uh, and for other stuff that's running Android, the hardware is the same, but the operating system is different, although it's also a Linux kernel. Uh, so for Android, we have a specific backend, which is quite similar to Linux ARM, but not entirely. Uh, Darwin, that's the, the kernel of uh, OS X. So uh, Darwin, uh, those are the OS X binaries. Uh, Windows uh, are the Windows binaries for running uh, uh, graphically. Uh, but if you want to have a uh, uh, terminal output, uh, you need to compile with a subsystem a console embedded in the executable as a setting. So I've, exec I've compiled most uh, examples, uh, uh, what we call MS-DOS. It's a bit weird, but it's really Windows console. It opens a console window for, uh, for text output. Uh, Syllable is our own operating system. And here I have a few special things that are, are special for the Raspberry Pi that don't work yet, but that's, uh, that's a variation of uh, Linux ARM. So if we go in the, in the Linux uh, folder, then you have a, a red folder and a red system folder with a lot of uh, binary examples that you can start uh, right away. And if you, uh, you, you can uh, download single files here. If you go to a single file and you click on uh, download here in the menu, then you get a single executable. And if you do that on, uh, on Linux or Darwin, uh, then it will work right away. Because, because we have our own compiler stack and our own linker, we have complete control over what would otherwise be dependency hell. And if I use libraries through bind bindings that I write, then you still get into dependency hell because of the versioning compatibilities of those third-party libraries. But there are also many, many uh, dependency problems that are created by the compiler toolchain. 
we, we, I found that out in, in our syllable operating system project where I ported lots of existing source code with GCC. And uh, also if you compile Rebel with, with a C compiler, because it's written in C, uh, you need uh, lots of different Rebel binaries for different versions of the GNU C library. And that shouldn't really be necessary because the C library is a very old standard. It's a first an ISO stand, an ANSI standard, then an ISO standard, then a POSIX standard. So why do you need more than one binary for different versions of the new C library? And still, that's true. But it's not true for red system uh, executables because we have uh, total control over what symbols we use. And uh, there are all sorts of nice stories about symbol versioning in, uh, in, in GCC and the GNU C library, GLIPC, but it doesn't work. You, you, for, for Rebel, there is a whole series, at this moment, three different binaries for different versions of the C library. So if you want to run Rebel uh, on Linux, first you have to find out uh, which version of the C library you have in your distribution. It's horrible. And we don't have that problem with Red because we compile uh, one executable and we make sure that it works on all C libraries because we only use the standard and not weird symbol versionings or new extensions or, or anything like that. So we make sure that you only need one executable for all Linuxes. And this is basically why Linux is still at 1% desktop use. Linux has become big uh, on servers, because it was much cheaper and it, and it replaced your expensive Unix servers. So it was already almost the same, a bit like Red is replacing Rebel now. Uh, and Linux is now becoming big on mobile phones, because uh, Windows uh, is, is, is too big and bloated and expensive to run on small phones. And, and, and credit cards, Raspberry Pis. So Linux is great if you really need to modify your system for a specific target and you need control, but Linux is still at 1% desktop use, which is why it's problematic to get within the French government and the Dutch government and the, and the houses of consumers, except on mobile phones and tablets now. Uh, and that is because independent software vendors who uh, supply applications uh, could never uh, compile uh, one program, one version on their program and, and say, here's a download, Download it in, in, in on your Linux and it will work. Couldn't you just build a static binary? Your, your binary. Your That's user. one one of the tricks to help it a little. But uh, but uh, the, every uh, the stack is so huge, like GCC is so much bigger than the Red stack uh, that every solution creates its own new problems. So you never get rid of the problem. The only way to get rid of it is to do everything all over again, create right. your own stack from the ground up. I agree there's a lot of diversity that's problematic, but I'm not sure if the single system and have you been Have really you been developing two open source operating systems for the past decade? I've, I've worked on two different distributions. Have you, have you made it your main occupation for a decade? <laughs> I thought that I thought exactly the same as you uh, 11 years ago when I started that trajectory. I thought it can't be that bad. If you put enough work in it, you must get somewhere. It must be solvable. I've worked on, on the syllable operating system plus a Linux distribution for 11 years. And, and, and you start to see that all those problems get worse over time. Complexity rises every year. And then the, the, the problems are ultimately caused by complexity of, in whatever form. But the, you're, you're basically doing the same thing by, you're, you're basically building statically, aren't you? Uh, not really, because um, uh, what you compile into Red uh, could be called static compilation, because it's one monolithic executable. Uh, but when I add my uh, library bindings, uh, let me show you. I'll go to the terminal. And I'll do an LDD of uh, the current, my current red interpreter. Uh, bin. And my, my red interpreter is a pinned version of the official red interpreter. So almost all my bindings are in there. 
and then you get uh, the, all the standard 60, 70 libraries that it depends on because uh, most of those are pulled in by GTK Plus. Sure. Because I've got a GTK uh, GUI uh, in this interpreter. And then you get into standard dependency hell. So uh, that, that's what I was telling a few minutes ago. Uh, uh, Red tries to be as static and monolithic as possible, as you said. Uh, but then when you're forced to use external libraries, for example, because you need to use the C library or you want to use GTK+, then you must pull in those libraries and then those become dependencies. So then you've solved half of dependency hell. You, you have solved the part of dependency hell that is in your own project, but you can't solve third-party dependencies that you use. Well, you can link against the static GTK+. Yes, but what you're doing then is, is you're, you're replacing, your, your, you're shifting your interface level. Uh, normally, your interface is between uh, RED and GTK+, and when you link in the entirety of GTK plus into your red executable, which is impossible at this moment because we can't link on external object files, but uh, that is a, a plan, so when that becomes possible, uh, we could link in uh, a GTK plus in our applications, but what you then have then done is you have shifted your interface from uh, the GTK plus API uh, to the Linux kernel API. Ultimately, do you know PCBSD? It's a, it's a free BSD distribution that links everything statically into all executables. So instead of using uh, GTK uh, interfaces and such, uh, uh, they're, they're using the free BSD kernel interface. So then you must hope that your kernel interface is more stable than the other interfaces. But the Linux kernel inter uh, interface is fairly stable. Um, well, in, in the Silver project, we have uh, uh, very specific thoughts about that, but that was for other presentations. Um, uh, the, the, do, you, do you see the problem? You're only shifting your interface from one API to another. So if the other API turns out to be more stable, you have gained some. Sure, but you but, 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 you but, but the other API can also shift. Sure, you're always dependent on the rest of the ecosystem. Yeah, yeah you, you, you always have an API to the system. And what we're trying to do is in red is, is get as close as possible to the hardware. So, so we try to run on Raspberry Pi and uh, the 8-bit uh, Atmel backend that I spoke about uh, runs uh, directly on an 8-bit Arduino with a very, very small uh, kernel uh, between it. So it has a very small API. So it almost runs directly on the hardware. So when, when you have your own uh, compiler backend, compiling binary code directly for the CPU, uh, you're compiling as straight to the CPU hardware as you can. And there's the, the, the word hardware. So then you're not interfacing with software, you're interfacing with hardware. But that means and that because it's hardware, the interface is much more stable because it's much more costly to change a hardware interface. Well, it also means that hardware software has to know about specifics. You can't rely on any abstraction interface anymore. You have to make them yourself. And that's what I'm going to show, that RED is the perfect tool to make abstractions. That's what was always the, 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 the aim of, of Rebel and, and Lisp and Scheme before it. And uh, that's, for example, I'm going to show the, the, the GUI abstraction on top of GTK. Then the other point, uh, uh, if you were to uh, follow that to its extreme, and you say, well, I, I, GTK has a shifting interface shifting API, for example. So then the conclu conclusion should be, uh, I have to link in all of GTK statically into my executable. Do you know how big GTK is? Mm -hmm. I just downloaded it. It was about uh, 150 megabytes okay. to get the example running. So That's probably a new Linux, because yeah. on, on my own Linux distro, I've seen it be 50, 60, 70 MB in an older GTK, uh, GTK2 version. But uh, let's say you're then statically linking 50 to 150 megabytes into your executable, which used to be 200 kilobytes of RAID. So we're not really satisfied with that engineering trade-off. So how are you solving libraries within RAID? 
Do you, do you mean linking libraries into yeah. Red or writing libraries into Red? Mm -hmm. since, since the last release, as I said a while ago, uh, uh, Red can compile not only executables but also shared libraries. Not static libraries and objects files yet, that's a uh, plan for the future. Uh, but um, uh, we can uh, produce uh, shared libraries now. So you could write, in, instead of C, you could use Red System to, use, to write a low-level shared library for some other language. Some other That's system. within Red. Because Red... You can, mean, you can also, um, uh, you can, you can also uh, put Red into that library. So then you write a shared library in Red. And then the entire Red runtime and interpreter goes into that shared library. It's compiled into it. Well, how do you, do you protect against changes in the API of that shared library to the, the Red shared library? That's, that's, that's the Rebel interface. And, right, and, still and, and the, the, the Red interface. And Red is, uh, Red is really a new paradigm for defining interfaces. Um, uh, uh, Rebel uh, was started with the aim of uh, writing programs in dialects instead of in object orientation. And most software these days uh, uses object orientation as its fundamental paradigm for uh, defining interfaces. So most interfaces in current software are objects. And then there are some things like uh, XML files and JSON and stuff like that. And that's already closer to, to Red because it's a, it's, a, it's a declarative data format. Uh, but uh, because uh, Red is a language toolkit, you, it's a toolkit to build languages, and we have built two, Red System and Red, but you can also very easily build your own languages. And um, uh, that means that uh, the interface is not object-oriented, but is a language. Can you show and that, that's how much, how much more flexible. Can you show how long? One of these interfaces. What yeah, that's my, my, my examples ahead. Mm -hmm. I hope um, I can still get to them. <coughs> We're doing our time. Not very good. So I'll try to to go through it faster. Okay. If you want to, if you want to try it on Windows, last thing I'll I'll say about this. Uh, for, for Windows, is what we talked about, you need all those dependencies. I'm using a lot of open source libraries that can be expected to be in Linux distros, but not in Windows. Uh, so in the binary downloads in, uh, for MS-DOS, uh, all the libraries are in there. The exe files and the DLL files, so all of GTK for Windows is in here. And that, that's why this repository is very large, uh, you, you immediately get a problem. Because it's nice that I can uh, uh, deliver the, the, the dependencies with the examples, but if you want to, to download this package from the Fossil server, uh, Fossil is going to make a package of the latest version and that currently takes two minutes uh, because the, 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 all the GTK uh, binaries and all that is in there. So it, immediate, it immediately creates problems. So. Examples. Uh, I already showed the, the, the dependencies of the Red interpreter. If I start the Red interpreter, I go into a standard language uh, interpreter console, and then uh, everybody everybody wants to see the hello world first. So that's it. That's, uh, that's hello world in, in red. Very, very, very simple. No, 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 as, as little boilerplate code as, as possible. But you can more or less do such things in, in Python and Ruby. But this can be compiled, so that's already a, a distinction. Now, for example, uh, let's try to uh, uh, show the hello world uh, graphical. Graphical Hello World. So this is a, a GTK Plus window, because I, I made the GUI so far uh, with uh, GTK Plus. And if you then want to show the, the, the Hello World for a, a GUI program, that's opening a window and, and showing Hello World. So that's what this does. Uh, it creates a text label 
in that in a window container, and that's it. So is that something you think you can do in, in another language? It depends on the standard library. But do, do you know of any language with any standard library that has a, 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 a graphical hello world that is this simple? Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> How about Tickle TK? Tickle TK. <laughs> yeah, probably. And I think Mathematica would have something like that. But there are just a few, and most of them are obscure or, or really expensive. But I mean, this, this view is. It's, it's a dialect. Yeah. I'll, uh, you, you, can, you can develop it further. The, the simplest form is, uh, is this. And here we have the, uh, the red block with uh, square brackets. So this is the, the basic elementary data structure of, uh, of red, a block. And then you, uh, you get an empty window because it's an empty block. Agreed? And then uh, to show that this is really a language dialect, um, let's go back to, uh, let's do it like this. Text label again, and then uh, uh, I, uh, let's say that I want a, a button to make it a little more complex. So I have a button, but it doesn't do anything yet if I click it, so I must use the, the close button. So uh, let's add a, a, a close action uh, to it. Could be that this already works. No, that's not enough. Okay. Control C it at this point, I think. This so this dialect description was uh, was not complete. So that crashes the interpreter. So you see that it, it, uh, it reacts very differently from um, a functional language that would say that the function parameters are not complete or something like that. So now uh, I add an, uh, an, an action description to the, the close action. Uh, I have to close is predefined, but I have to tell it what it needs to do on close. And that is again done with a, a block in square brackets. Still doesn't quit. I'll, uh, I shouldn't have done this manually. I have this all prepared in, uh, in fixed scripts. So now I don't remember the, the syntax that I invented myself. But then this is the principle. And uh, 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 the thing is that uh, uh, what's in the in the square brackets quit is normal red. Then you get the, the functional language. So you can uh, enter any red expression in there. Um, but all the rest, the, the button and the, the string label, are not functional syntax. It's not a functional language and it's not object oriented. It's a dialect. It's a dialect of red because red is a language construction kit. And I made my own language uh, to define uh, graphical uh, dialects and I happen to use GTK as a backend for now. So I'll show some uh, uh, predefined things that are working. Um, the graphical ones are further on. Here's the, the standard hello world that I showed. And if you want to compile it, uh, you add a, uh, it becomes a script file, so you add a, a header with metadata, which doesn't really mean much except uh, to note that it's a, a red script. And then you have to, like in C, you have to uh, include uh, my GTK uh, binding. That's already uh, in, in the interpreter, that's why view worked immediately. 
But if you compile it, it becomes more C-like, so you have to include that binding. Um, uh, actually, uh, you can write the same thing in red system. So I have also written this example, this hello world example for GTK plus in, uh, in, uh, in red system uh, in the way that you would write it in C or, or other low level languages. And uh, that's why I called it, uh, instead of hello world, I called it good goodbye cruel world. Because this is how you normally program GTK from something like C or C++ is a little shorter and Python becomes uh, even a bit more shorter. But if you write in Red System or C without a dialect, it, it becomes something like this. And it does exactly the same as this. But this is a dialect where all that is, is put under the hood. And here's a, a, a more advanced example. I oh, see I... Uh, I, uh, I can't use a close and a quit at the same time. Close is a predefined action. So uh, I, I shouldn't have used, do I still have it here? No. I shouldn't have used close and, uh, and quit at the same time. It's either one or the other. That was my error. So here's a, a standard close button, uh, a quit button with uh, the standard close action. And this adds uh, uh, a window title. And uh, actually, I have done uh, something very simple, uh, similar in Red System, uh, which is uh, very low level. But it looks almost the same. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's not as short as the Red version, but in Red System I also did something with view and, uh, and, 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 and button and, uh, and icon... Uh, icon uh, uh, we only see a button all one. Oh yeah, five, three, sorry. sorry. I don't think I can get this higher. Ah, can I should realize that it's... I could, uh, I could delete the, uh, the header. Can you see it now? Yeah. And on top it prints uh, the GTK version. So it's really the, the thing from view on. And you have to include it in a, a GTK namespace. So that's uh, in, because red is more dynamic. I could put, put that. I could take that out in the in the red version. So the red version is even simpler. But something in that direction can already be done in red system. But this is really functional. It looks the same, but in red system these are really function calls. So you could do something similar in C just wouldn't look as good. But uh, if, you, if you program it without using anything like a dialect interpreter, then it looks like this. This is Hello World in GTK. Uh, I, I ported this from an example on Wikipedia, I think. In an example in C on Wikipedia about GTK, I ported it to Red System. So this is Hello World in, in a low-level language without a dialect. So this is how you, uh, how you play with language constructs and make dialects to make programming uh, much simpler for specific purposes. Because this is a, a dialect, a language, a domain-specific language uh, for making GUIs. And you can see that in the Red System version, uh, you can still see that it works on GTK. There are a few constructs where you can see GTK. But in the red version, it's, uh, it's become so abstract that it's not GTK anymore. So I can implement the very same dialect on other, other GUI toolkits, if, if they're easy enough to bind to. Uh, so uh, Nainat from red is, is currently uh, creating a GUI uh, binding for Android, so that you can do similar things on Android. And uh, uh, we, we're planning to make those, uh, those GUI specifications as similar as possible between GTK and Android and the Windows and, and, and native uh, Mac OS backends. Oh, yeah. I think my, uh, my time is up. How much time do I have? Yeah. Uh
Not yeah. really. I, I had a lot more to show, but the, the thing is, if you, if you want to explain this, the fundamentals of the language and the, the ramifications, uh, and uh, then you get into a lot of questions and then it becomes uh, slow going. So uh, I guess you'll all have to, to return the next year for the next half of the presentation. I had all these uh, zero and Q examples and, uh, and all that. I can flip through them very, very quickly. Four here already. Ah, here are the, uh, the zero and Q examples. Ah, this is interesting. This is a low world in a, in a, in a, in a kernel driver. Uh, this is a, a Windows kernel driver written in red system. Uh, to try to write a, a kernel driver in red is one bridge too far because then you get a dynamic interpreter in, in the kernel just for a driver. That's probably not what you want. It's probably too hard, although it could be tried. So this is written in red system. And this is a Windows kernel driver that says hello world. And to do that, you bind uh, to the Windows kernel, the NT kernel. Uh, you pull in one kernel function, the, the debug print function. Uh, so you, you print hello world not to the, the, the terminal, uh, but to the Windows debug log that you have to view in a debugger. And then uh, all you need for a, a minimal kernel driver is one entry point. So it's just one function that is the standard entry point for the minimal entry point for a Windows kernel driver. And it returns zero to signal success. And it prints uh, the log message uh, through that uh, kernel uh, function binding. So that's to show uh, how low level we can go. And then here I had uh, zero MQ examples. Uh, for the pipeline example from the nano message presentation, uh, you have a, a ventilator uh, that sends uh, red code to an arbitrary number of workers. This is the worker and it's all about 50, 60 lines of red. And most of it is just set up and tear down of 0 and Q. And then uh, you have a, a sync process that collects the results from all those workers and uh, uh, what I wanted to show here is that uh, uh, 0MQ and nano message uh, specify almost nothing about the message format. But red is all about specifying languages and data formats. So red is an excellent uh, companion to 0MQ to and nano message to send red messages, uh, code and data, because in, in a, in a, in a Lisp-like language code and data are, are almost the same. And so I send uh, from the ventilator, I send uh, a red expression in text form to the workers. Uh, the workers uh, uh, translate it to, uh, to a red code, uh, execute it and send the result onto the ventilator as a, a red data format, a, a, a small uh, record like JSON but entirely built into red uh, on principle. And then the, the ventilator reads that data record, which is in the very same red format, the very same language notation, and it, 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 it checks if it's an integer type, because types are dynamic, and if it's an integer, it adds it uh, up to the, the total of the results of all the work processes. And I was hoping to show that working, but uh, this is, uh, this is the, the, the guess of it. So I'll have to leave it at this for now. Okay. Uh, uh, okay, thank you for uh, presenting about the red programming language. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll stop filming myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now I have a